Hey guys, today I'm here with a guest and I'm just going to let you hit the ground running. Go ahead and introduce yourself and who you are, what you're about, what we're doing here. Awesome. I'm thrilled to be here. I am Sunflower Medicine and that name reflects everything that I love and that I've learned over the last few years in my, my journey, my spiritual journey. I am Sunflower. People who know me just get that. Uh, a bit of radiance and resonance. And there's a part of me that has learned that I am a healer, not only my own healer, but provide that for other people. So Sunflower Medicine is who I am. I am launching a new book um, and a new website. I've got some YouTube videos that support this 21 day transformation journey. And I'm just thrilled to be here to share it with you. So when we speak on transformation, we're talking about personal growth, healing, healing trauma, healing the body, healing the mind, all of this. Yes. All of the above. My experience has been, I, I've been somebody who's always kind of looked for things that resonate that, and I've been curious about learning and growth naturally, but I've been pulled to this evolution that really feels transformational. And, you know, it wasn't a plan. I didn't go out and say, I want to transform myself, yeah. but as the pull has come, I've just, I've seen the opportunity and um, gathered some, some wisdom around that. Absolutely. It is it's kind of a choice, but it's not a choice until later on. Sometimes I, uh, in the beginning, we just kind of, yeah, get thrown into this direction of, you know, it's usually we're trying to have, usually we have a certain problem. Um, A whole, whole, whole lot of us start with a physical problem, like with the body, a sickness of some sort. And upon trying so deeply to heal this, like, you know, we have the access to the internet now brings us ridiculous amounts of opportunities and possibilities. There's, there's a way to fix yourself. I feel thoroughly. You just have to keep turning over stone after stone, after stone, after stone. There's millions of techniques and modes that we can go towards and if this one doesn't work for you that doesn't mean that you can't find one that will and that does you just have to move on to the next thing and move on to the next thing um 100 percent yeah and, and it's funny because it, whether I've been doing professional coaching or individual a lot of people one of the biggest obstacles to taking someone to the next level is if things are already working you know, if I'm already healthy and I'm kind of meeting my goals, I'm less likely to take a risk. Mm -hmm. But I remember it was 2017, 2018, and a friend of mine said, so what's next for you? You know, and I just very innocently said, I'd really liked, I think what's next for me is a real true spiritual journey. Now, in my naive mind, that meant I'd like to go to Spain or Portugal and do the Santiago, the Camino de Santa, you know, something like that. I want to take a trip and walk a church something. I then got diagnosed with cancer and, you know, uh, changed jobs and moved cities and all of these things and got thrown into the opportunity that is available when you really you have no choice but to explore what else is out there, what else I'm capable of. And uh, I'm so much better for it. You know, I it, how many people have said these hardships turned out to be the blessing of my life. And so, you know, fixing things is certainly our favorite way to learn. Mm -hmm. But there's, all, you know, as you said, as we get older, we have the opportunity to say, I want to look at how I can expand. Maybe there's more available. Maybe there's another level of expression of who I am that I haven't explored yet or fulfillment. And uh, that's, you know, that's transformation for me. Sure. We get really confused about what spirituality actually means because we don't collectively as a society and culture, unless you've been really deeply enrooted in a uh, religious background of some sort. Um, but even then, Hold on. Uh, let me focus real fact before I go on a tangent. But um, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're so 
attuned to the physical aspects of stuff is it concrete enough to see it hear it feel it touch it you know or it's not real and then so and that is so deeply enrooted in everything that it stretches into the deep religious so many people who are deeply religious if it's not physical like the, it's so funny you know we'll believe in a god the all-powerful mystical magic hey, yes <laughs> jesus healed and did all of these crazy magical things but also concrete disc is real nothing else magic is not yes. <laughs> yes. it's so funny that we can hold those parallels simultaneously within ourselves but um backing up just a little bit tell us about your cancer journey like how old were you when that happened yeah. I was goodness I was 52 okay um and I was diagnosed with throat cancer mm. and it goes align a along with what you said I had read a lot I'd always kind of been curious and spiritual I grew up in the church but then also kind of explored um the course in miracles and different things about my own individual power and so when I was faced with that I knew in my head, I could explain the fact that I am a spirit in a physical body, mm -hmm. but my access to them being connected, I just didn't have it. I could watch every Joe Dispenza video out there and get it in my mind and something that I could, could explain and understand, but I still wasn't accessing it. Mm -hmm. And for me, because I was so stubborn and stuck in my paradigms, plant medicine was really good for me because it kind of took down some of the walls and allowed me to look at something beyond what I could comprehend or even explain. And it's funny because when I try to explain it, I don't do it justice, mm -hmm. but I, I can certainly exemplify it and live it. So, but that's where I got when I, when I, when I went there, when I went beyond what I could concrete understand put in a box i experienced the connection of my mind my body and my spirit and the power that that provides and so the lessons the the courses the the information that that i'm bringing is that is that wisdom the 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 information i've gotten from that place and access to that place so i love that you say that that's where we start and it's all well intended human beings learning linearly mm -hmm. and defining things but it, it 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 limits what we can learn and experience it does uh our experience of this reality is incredibly limiting if we stay within the boxes and the confines that have been placed you know outwardly for us to pick up and adopt um words we get too hung up on words when they're more abstract and generic than concrete like again we want to believe everything is nothing's linear everything's multi-dimensional and yeah how the hell do you box that up in a way that someone quote unquote normal can understand just that's right, just that's right. the real magic of what we're experiencing now is i would say for the first half of my life it was all very linear and very grounded and very human right but we're given the opportunity now and whether or not it's been available to previous generations i don't know i haven't seen it or witnessed it but this generation me right now i really have the access to being a human that can experience and witness more of the the universal laws and the spiritual laws and things like that so but i have to keep in mind and i'm constantly reminded that this is a human journey right and so um i i can't just manifest you know something an apple in my hand or whatever it doesn't necessarily work that way there's a human element to it that um is is uh, a double-edged sword right <laughs> we haven't figured yeah, out how to right. unlock the powers of jesus yet <laughs> that's right that's right even Gina, jesus couldn't get an apple in his hand by saying it he could certainly turn water into wine i'm curious about that one but yeah anyway <laughs> so plant medicine was your bridge 
It gave me access. And I would say it's because I was so intellectual, right? And so, um, and I had never even smoked pot when I went to Costa Rica and said, I'm going to do four straight days of ayahuasca. Oh my God. And, uh, <laughs> that is intense. <laughs> Jump yeah. Into the deep end. That's right. I'm in. Um, and it required, it took probably at least two of those days just to let go. Sure. Right. And to turn off my mind. Um, but when I did that, I really, I really talked to God and, um, I, and I know that ayahuasca doesn't cure cancer, um, but I do, you know, and I sensed that before and ayahuasca gave me access to that. So um, that was my introduction to plant medicine. Yeah. Yeah. The body is capable of healing itself. If we can just support it and in a way direct it in how to do so. Allow it. Yeah. <laughs> that was the big sure. thing for me. Right. Because I had gotten a lot of the, the direction and the meditation and the place, but allowing it, um, allowing something to happen that I wasn't controlling and that I didn't necessarily understood was the gap would, that was my bridge. Yeah. So Beautiful. what was the, uh, what did you discover in your journey? Yeah, a few things and they're, they're, they're in my book, but I'll tell you the fu fundamental thing. So the first time I went and did ayahuasca, it was because I was sick. Mm -hmm. The second time I was healed, I was better. And I'm like, what if you go do that? And like, don't have a problem to solve. You can just do anything right now. And I went into it as a very Westernized American. And, you know, looking back, if you could ask God anything, I went in and wanted a business plan. <laughs> I wanted answers to my career, you know, and there were people who were like, I want to know who my next boyfriend's going to be. And I'm like, we can do better. We're so human. I, I see that now. Right. But I went in and I was in, but I didn't want to be so crass as to say, I'd like a business plan. I went in and I said, I want to know my soul's purpose. There you go. Now, part of me believed that was going to be keywords and a business plan, or, you know, SEO optimization. No, <laughs> it took a little while in the medicine for me to let go, you know? So I did some purging. I kind of let go. And toward the end of it, I just started seeing the most wonderful, amazing visions and waterfalls, uh, hearts, puppies, rainbows, just stuff. And really what the message I got was your only purpose is to love and be loved period. The rest is handled. Mm -hmm. And that's like the first two chapters of this book, what it takes to believe that the rest is handled, mm -hmm. but what it provides to live that the rest is handled is just beautiful and amazing. So I would say there's been, a, there's been a lot, but, um, that one has certainly shaped my view of life. And that's it. And, you know, I, I saw this thing on your website or it said it, it's all simple, but it's not easy. And that, that's right. That is it. That is it thoroughly. It's simple, but it's not easy because you have to get through the humanness of it. Yeah, to the other that's side. right. And if it were easy, everybody would do it. Right. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it is it, it, it's easy. It, it's simple to understand. But it goes against everything we've believed around control, around money. Like seriously, early on, the another you know exploration in this book is what what how do I get value? Who am I? What value do I provide? And the first you know in my thirties and forties, I was a mom, and um, I love that. It, I grew a lot. I learned so much of it, but. I came out of it believing that my value was my service, how I serve and how I put other people first and what I do for other people. And that business thing is the same thing. You know, Americans think that our value is determined by how much money we make and whether what our job title is and what car we drive and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, getting to a point that my value is the energy that I bring to a room and to a conversation. 
it's hard to understand. It's hard to quantify. Um, and it's it and and it's hard to um, measure the benefits that I give or I provide because I don't get paid for it. it doesn't cost me anything. So it's a new it's a new paradigm, but it really is around how how do I fully express my value, who I am, and um, currency. The energy is a currency is a is a completely different conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's this uh, little story that people use to translate all of this. And it's about this little boy who was on the beach and all of these starfish got washed up onto the beach and they're, you know, struggling or whatever, whatever. And just one by one, he's picking them up and tossing them back into the ocean. But there's millions of these starfish washed up on the, on the shore. And his father's like, son, what are you doing? You could never make a difference. And the little boy in response picks up a star, another starfish, tosses it back into the ocean and says, I made a difference for that one. And uh, that's exactly what it is. You know, we, we make everything too big and too grand. I think because uh, media has made everything big and grand. And so it's just naturally become programmed into us as part of our ideology. But you're exactly right. The biggest differences that you can make is in your community, in your family, in your social groups and networks, you know, one yeah. person at a time, just being present and helpful. And, and sometimes yeah. that means being present and just not hurtful. You know, um, there's a difference between a uh, you know, okay, so this past weekend we had a festival in my hometown and my children are part of the Cub Scouts. So we had a little booth set up and uh, man, that was the last thing I wanted to do was add something <laughs> to my calendar for the week to show up and work and do, right? But the thing is, is that I showed up and I didn't even have to do anything but be present. The, the children yeah. handled most of it. The couple of other adults that were there took the initiative to manage the money and the, the talking to the other, the strangers for the donations and all of the things. All I had to do was be there. And that made a big enough impact in that yes. circle. Uh, meanwhile, I had an event yesterday that we went to and which was completely different. And I'll spare you the details, but there was someone sitting beside me and they complained about everything the entire time. So, you know, and that's the difference right there is you show up with the right energy to even if you can't, even if you don't have the capacity to really put forth the effort and work and do, we don't have to do more. We feel like we have to do and more. And just the thought of me going to that thing was exhausting, but I went anyway and the universe provided. And all I had to do was hang yeah. out and sit. And love yeah. and just be who you are. Yeah. And, you know, early on, back when I was still trying to figure it all out and I was listening to a lot of law attraction videos and what to do. And really I worked on how to elevate my frequency, mm -hmm. how to have a higher energy. And where I am now is that it, it isn't forcing or creating a higher energy. It's allowing my natural energy is off the charts. It's there. So long as I am in love, so long as I am in, in service. But when I'm in, and, and this is a thing where I, um, a model that we have in the third week called clearing the fog, three things, F-O-G, fear, obligation, and guilt. Mm -hmm. Still love, right? When I'm there out of obligation and not out of love and not out of self-expression, my self gets squashed. My love gets minimized. And so part of allowing it is to recognize those things that get in the way. Fear. What are you afraid of? And what have you been conditioned to believe, you know, will happen if you don't follow the mainstream definition of success and expectations, mm -hmm. obligations? Every Anytime somebody tells me I can't because I have to, 
there's an obligation there. And, there, and we forget that we actually, as humans, have the ability to negotiate. We have the ability and check in as a as a codependent mom, a one time codependent mom. I found that a lot of the obligations I had to other people, they never asked me to do that. Right. I didn't have to do that. Um, and then the guilt piece is a lot of just forgiving yourself, allowing that part of the learning process is failure. Mm -hmm. um, fail fast. We all do it. It's a part of growth. And so, um, yeah, eliminating, clearing the fog allow, puts us in a place where we can allow our energy. We don't have to work on bringing a high energy. It's already there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, guilt is actually lower in vibration than fear is. And then obligation creates resentment. So that's just a risk mm -hmm. for sure. I love that. So do you know a lot about the, I know, is it, I remember the doctor who okay. has the Hawkins, Dr. Hawkins, David Hawkins, right. Yep. Um, and you know, uh, where those land and love is, love is up there, the higher frequency. Mm -hmm. And I loved studying that. I found it fascinating. And once you experience it and living, live it and go look at it from this point is completely different from where I was the academic. I want to move up the ladder sort of thing. So, yeah. 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 Uh, also, you have to remember a little bit of psychology plays in there and like can really, really help you not only understand yourself and why you do the things you do and why you have the patterns you have and how you can overcome those, but to also understand the people around you and how not to take on their energies because you know for example uh that was that a thing uh somebody tried to make me feel guilty yesterday at this thing well actually it was the same person that was sitting there complaining <laughs> pointed <laughs> out something that technically was a truth about me and how i had like what i had been doing i had only made it to a handful of these things and they're pointing it out and how I should feel bad about that. And old me would have taken that to heart and it would have destroyed me for weeks. I would have sat and thought yeah. about, you know, like, oh my God, they're right. I could have done better. I should have done. And then and I, they saw it. Yes. <laughs> but no, I stopped that right in its tracks. And uh, because I've done all of this uh, development, because everything's a pattern and, you know, it's simple, but it's difficult but it also gets easier as you practice because we all have a set of patterns and these patterns will keep cycling in on themselves and coming back yes. up for you to deal with them again and again and again until, you know, used to, it would have destroyed me for weeks, possibly longer. And then it would have destroyed me for a few days. And then it may have like popped up from time to time again. And like, oh, the guilt would be there again. And before it would, you know, move on. And then, uh, so now I'm able to stop it when it happens. Like as soon awesome. as that pattern pops up, I'm like, oh, I see you. I see you. you know that. That's it's terrific. Really, it's them projecting their own belief systems on you yeah. because there's no way they could have known what I had going on and why I couldn't make those other meetings. It's none of their business. It's not. Right? It's not. And it's but that's that's awareness. That's mindfulness. Mm -hmm. That's you recognizing that there's only you, right? Nobody put those things in your head. One of the practices I've been taking on recently is to really recognize that I live in heaven on earth. Like seriously, we are as close as I could have imagined to heaven on earth. I live in Texas. The weather's gorgeous. I go outside, it's a nice 78 degrees. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my dog is there. We're going to go get coffee. And I'm like, it's my, I talk to my kids. It's good. And then there's a point in my, when I realized that I am arguing with someone in my head mm -hmm. and I'm like, is this how you really want to spend heaven on earth? Is this really what you want to do right now? And so I can stop myself, right? That's all there is. The good news is it's all you. The bad news is it's all you. Right? <laughs> so yeah, that's that's a great story. And it's it's a great example of constantly just being committed to that that kind of a life. 
Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I wish that once we do it, it's handled, but we get to there. One of the ways I say it is we get to choose how we want to learn our lessons, right? So we can just keep learning it the same way. It's going to keep coming, but, but we're, it's never all handled, but you're choosing to learn it faster and faster and faster and just cut down that time in your head. I think that's awesome. Yeah, it's every single bit of it is self-awareness, just extreme yes. self-awareness all the time. Because like you said, the dialogue in our heads is going all of the time and it's just on autopilot. So mm -hmm. for one, we spend the most time with ourselves and our inner dialogue is that which we hear the most. So if Though if that inner dialogue is, you know, telling us that we're lazy or that we shoulda, coulda, woulda, or mm -hmm. whatever, shouldn't have done that. Hey, remember that time in fifth grade when you embarrassed the crap out of yourself? Don't you hate <laughs> Yeah. And it's just, you're right. It's for one, noticing it because most of us aren't aware of it in the first place at all. Right. And right. Then, stopping it in its tracks and being like, and it helps to like give it a name or recognize that it's two separate things. Your mental chatter is not your highest self. It's, it's, you are the <laughs> conscious observer of the mental chatter and you can choose to stop that mental chatter, change that mental chatter. And it is absolutely difficult in the beginning because, you know, you've spent 25 years, 35 years, 55 years, however old you are, not controlling it and letting yes. it run around like an untrained dog now. You're not a puppy anymore. It's an untrained dog. Yes. And it's really hard to teach an old dog new tricks, but it's not impossible. All you have to do is have a little bit of awareness and yes. awareness and responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Recognizing that nobody's doing this to you, right? That, that so the awareness is the first step and the next step is who I'm going to be in the matter. And so it's, I love the way you talk about it. It's beautiful. And one of the things we, we look at is consider that your energy is currency. Mm -hmm. It is as valuable as money. And in our, in our Western world, we save money. We count money. We know how much money we have in the bank. We know things that cost us money. We know things that bring us money, right? And so getting that awareness to where this is messing with my frequency. This is messing with me allowing my highest self, which is that high energy. And to be aware of things that I do that cost me energy. Sitting next to that lady is going to cost me energy today, right? <laughs> And some days I've got it to spare and some days I don't, you know, but um, sitting next to that lady is going to build my energy and, and recognizing my, this much time on social media is, uh, will sustain my energy. This much will, will zap it, you know, and looking at and being response. So that awareness is the first part, but being responsible for it and, to, and making those plans, those actions, having it really be relevant is is a is a great way to manage that energy mm -hmm. like it's money yeah mm -hmm. uh, and then we have to come back to clearing the fog because most of us don't want to and it's not our fault that's the thing you have you can't beat yourself up about this once you start realizing it um going back to how the mental chatter is not you the brain's purpose and goal and everything is to protect you so yes it can be really scary to take responsibility. Most people don't want to take responsibility because that means you're your own problem. And if you have problems in your life, it's you. <laughs> That's yeah. It. Even a two-year-old avoids blame. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and I'm fascinated by this, that even a two-year-old is scared to be responsible. Who did this? There's, what is that going to mean? So we've been conditioned from a very young age to avoid responsibility, mm -hmm. but that's where the power is, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Choosing the power. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Super simple. You just have to do it. Yeah. Um, it's funny. One of the, uh, 
one of the stories in my book is about uh, a trip that I took. It was another, I was, I was on an ayahuasca retreat, but I did it at this place that has a, a labyrinth of cactus. And I had no idea what to expect, but there were thousands of cactus, cacti. And I had never been around anything like that. And I kind of went into it saying, I was at a place where I was really mad at myself because I know since I can remember, like even in grade school, I was like voted most friendly. I was a good person. I've been a good, kind person, right? And since I can remember, I've woken up and said, I'm going to do my best today and I'm going to have no regrets. Now, here I am over 50 looking back thinking, there are some cringeable moments, right? I have made some stupid choices despite my best efforts. So I went into this labyrinth and it had three sections. And um, uh, the first one was going to be my past. And I'm like, I want to make peace with the decisions I've made in my life. I want to get some clarity on what the heck I was thinking and how I can stop messing up like that, right? So I go into the labyrinth and I'm just overwhelmed by these huge 12 feet cactus. Some of them are three feet. Some of them are ugly. Some of them are beautiful. And I'm like, this is all the decisions I've made in my life. I am surrounded. They are big. They are ugly. They are complex. But I got really present to the courage it took to make some of them, you know, and the good intentions behind them. And, and I really just kind of made peace and kind of, you know, allowed myself to be proud of the human experience I've been through so that I kind of got to the presence and I'm like all right I'm gonna be kind of peaceful with this I got it I'm just gonna go sit with this for a little bit before I go into this third future part so I did you know kind of and I, it even makes me want to exhale now I had to just really kind of unload the baggage I was carrying around about not being perfect mm -hmm despite the best intentions and people not getting it about me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, you know what? There were some really hard decisions that it took courage to make, that it took courage to own and live through. And, and you've done that. You've done well. And I went into the third part, the future. And it struck me that all I saw in that one was more decisions, mm -hmm. more decisions, more decisions. Oh, that's what they're, it's choices. We're taking choices and we're going to do our best. And we're going to, you know, it takes a lot of courage and a lot of grace for ourselves. But we're just, we're human. No matter how much we learn about the universe and energy and how things work, we're going to be faced and deal with our humanity. So I recommend grace and love, you know, yeah. Yeah, that, that helped me also because you're right. You cannot escape being human no matter how hard you try. We are all going to make mistakes for the rest of our lives. It doesn't matter how much work we do. It doesn't matter how hard we try. We are going to mess it up from time to time until we die. And something that helped me a lot, because I also held a lot of guilt on like, oh, why did I say that? Why did I do that? I, oh. And you just have to remember that perfectionism is not a thing or perfection is not a thing. Uh, perfectionism is poison. And as mm. long as in your heart because there's going to be a thousand different people too that think that you're actually a bad person no matter what yeah no matter what's right you cannot yeah everyone people are going to project people are going to make their own conclusions people are going to be jealous people are good people are going to people and the only thing you can do to find peace with it all is to ask yourself am i doing my best and is my heart in the right place yeah and if the answer is yes, then you just got to figure out how to relax and allow life. That's right. And did I make a mistake? You know, sometimes I made a mistake and it's either I didn't have the right information or I ignored that information again, or I chose the hard way to learn this lesson again. Um, but that again, uh, as you said it, it we're not perfect. It's part of being human. And it's what, what if? The only reason we're here is to learn. Mm -hmm. We can't be perfect. 
and learn. We can't already know it all and learn. Mm -hmm. And so really getting to look at everything as, you know, the person who sits next to you saying, what is this teaching me today? You know, traffic. <laughs> what is this teaching me? My kids, my grandkids, what, do, what is this teaching me? Um, really opens up a lot of opportunity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Probably patience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a constant lesson, but there's beauty in it all. Mm -hmm. Acceptance, mm -hmm. surrender. I also have, yeah. to say I mentioned that earlier, but children will teach you quicker than anything, I believe. Oh yeah. It's funny because, sorry, my camera's messing up. Um, I had a, I talked with a shaman, shaman one time because I was having a hard time with one of my adult daughters. And I asked her, how can a mom be happy when her kids aren't? And I thought this was like the best question. Like, like, and she didn't hesitate. And she said, you can't make your kids happy. You can't make them make healthy choices. Mm -hmm. The best you can do is show them what happy and healthy looks like. Mm -hmm. And it opened up this whole thing for me. I can't make my kids be grateful. I can show them what being grateful looks like. Mm -hmm. I even do it at work. I can't show P I can't expect people to be confident in what I'm bringing, but I can be, I can show them what confidence looks like. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole thing in, uh, in week one of this book about comp compromises we make. And it, this service attitude will say, well, I can't be comfortable because I don't want to make them uncomfortable. You can't make them comfortable. Mm -hmm. You can only show them what comfortable looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't make them feel prettier by making yourself feel small. You can only show them what confident and pretty looks like, mm -hmm. you know? And so I got that from raising kids. I learned so much about me and my life from being a mom. Oh yeah. yeah most of us do for sure. Yeah. We we don't know anything about ourselves until we have children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I agree though. You, you, the only thing we can do is lead by example. Yeah. And, you know, to, to tell our kids that we want them to be less anxious, but then be stressed out about how anxious our kids are makes no sense. You know, you've yeah. got to model it. And so that was a hard lesson for me. Yeah. And like, uh, we can do a whole episode on the phrase, fake it till you make it because <laughs> It's, there's problem there's problems within it a lot but mm -hmm. uh yeah I'll be completely rattled with anxiety like to this day like I have like stuff around the dentist I have a lot of trauma there and then like um uh, you know we live in tornado alley so like storms and stuff it, on the inside I am completely racked with stress and anxiety but on the outside I'm projecting calm nonchalantness for my children, you know, so that yeah. that's panic. So that's an interesting thing because there's there's a lot of when we swallow our emotions and don't express them, they stay in us. So yeah. so you you know, while there's a need to do that, and we actually I learned a lot about myself and my ability to do that, right? Because I had to control my emotions more. But the other thing is looking for the appropriate way to express your emotion, right? The appropriate way and time. Sometimes it isn't in the moment while the kids are scared too. Sometimes it's somewhere else where you just need to let go and acknowledge what you just went through. Mm -hmm. um, I think moms tend to think we're supposed to be numb and we've got to be numb in order to do what, what our kids need and what our families need and what our communities and the ch and it's church and the school. We've just got to plow through but doing that will give you cancer. I'm here to say, you know, smushing that down, um, you, you've got to have healthy ways to go and meditate, talk to a friend, um, explore and really be honest about where you were in that moment and what you were afraid of, how it could have been and, and, you know, what that means to you. So that's, I think, I didn't have that wisdom. I didn't have anyone around to share that with me when I was raising my kids. And so I hope I can share that with some moms. Um, yeah, we're so called to be human, superhuman. 
-hmm. as moms. There's an expectation. And even the research that I, Gabor Mate is one of my favorites who talks about how children, the trauma that children experience just based on the fact that like dinner was late. <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, no pressure, but now, you know, it doesn't matter what I do. My kids are going to have a traumatic response. And so we're called to really create a perfect life for our kids. And there's valor in it. I totally get it. But another thing we've got to teach our kids is how to manage, express emotions in, in an appropriate and healthy way. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah. I tell them that uh, well, this is with the dentist thing. We had this uh, whole conversation recently that um, fear. All right. So courage is not an emotion. It's a choice. And that we're all afraid. Everyone yes. is afraid of something somewhere at some point. None of us is fear are fearless. Um, but it, we have to choose to act in courage and bravery despite the fear because if we let the fear take over then we make really bad choices honestly fear it, it's there to protect us but also it's it sabotages us a lot of the time yes yes but i would like to come back around to the cancer thing again though and see if i can get you to tell us a little bit more about the healing process yeah so when i first found out that i had throat cancer I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to handle this, this, I am a spirit in a body and I'm going to, I'm going to start eating vegan. And, and the first thing I really did was I acknowledged that I had taken my body for granted hmm. as a mom. And I'd always been an athlete. So if I wanted to go do a triathlon, I would do it without training. You know, I was strong and I could just go out and did it, do it. And I wasn't nice to my body. You know, I, I just took it for granted. So the first thing I did was commit that, listen, I'm going to listen to you. We're going to do this together. I'm connecting. Let's go. So for about the first four to six months, the growth stopped, but it wasn't getting smaller. So I wasn't necessarily getting the results I wanted. I was getting some. And I like I talked to one coach about it who was like, you just got, I can see a lot of whatever, something elevated in your liver. This is a sign that you're carrying a lot of anger. I'm like, I'm not angry. I'm the nicest person you've ever met. And now I realize it wasn't that I didn't have anger. It was that I didn't express anger. But so I, I didn't see that then. But then I got to where this is not, I'm not healing. I've got to go to the doctor. And um, at that time I was living in Connecticut. I came home to Houston. I went to the cancer center here in Houston. I'm like, all right, what do we got to do? And they gave me a treatment plan that included 35 radiation treatments. I'm like, if this were a smaller tumor, how many treatments would we have there? 35. If this were a bigger tumor, how many radiation? 35. I'm like, so we're just going to go to 35 rounds of radiation and seven rounds of chemotherapy. I'm like, oh God. Okay. 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 So we start and within like two weeks, 10 sessions, 12, something like that. My body was like, no, this is barbaric. This is barbaric. And I tried to kind of like rationalize it, but I'm like, hang on. I made a commitment to my body. I would listen you know? And so I didn't tell most of the people in my life. I told my mom because I was staying with her. I didn't tell my daughters. I didn't tell my best friends because oh. there's so much pressure to go ring the bell, be brave, you know? And so I didn't tell them. Um, but I fired my oncologist. I'm like, we're not doing this anymore. I, I, I don't, I, so I don't know if that had an effect, but um, then I had to get really serious. I'm like, okay, we've got to find a way for me to connect my body with my spirit because it's disconnected. And a friend had told me about this place. She went uh, with ayahuasca. And when she had told me about it, like three months before, I'm like, oh, I don't do that. That's not me. I don't do that. But I'm like, hey, <laughs> tell me more about this place. I'm going to go give it a try. And um, like I said, my first two, two sessions were about just letting go. 
And by the third one, the message I got was like, you're fine. You're fine. It's okay. And um, I had to wait another six weeks until the treatments would have been finished before they would they would retest and see how I was. And I went back and it's completely gone. And it's been five years. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, and I'm not going to say that maybe the 10 treatments maybe made a decision. Again, ayahuasca doesn't cure cancer. I do. Mm -hmm. I do. Um, and my, and a cancer journey, any health journey is a personal journey and yeah. you've got to go, you've got to listen to your body and you've got to do what your body tells you. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't mean that it's not going to tell you to go get surgery or go to the doctor, mm -hmm. but, um, they're connected mm -hmm. and your choices, the choices that you make, we're so tempted to have our choices be made by the fear driven I mean, those doctors called me and they're like, we're pulling for you. We don't want you to get, you're going to die. They told my daughter that if I didn't get my treatment, um, that I would lose my voice box and I'd have one of those holes in my throat. They told her that. And I, I'm like, I'm so sorry they said that to you. That's not going to happen. And um, no, the, uh, you have a say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you do. They say that it the treatment itself doesn't really matter as much as your belief in the treatment does. So if you believe, if you have to go the Western medicine route in order to believe that that's what will heal you, then that's what you have to do. But if you yeah. believe that there are other ways, then you can absolutely heal through other ways. One of the books I read in those first few months was called You Are the Placebo. Have you heard of that one? Yeah. yeah but yes. <laughs> but the um the research shows that the most successful drug trials ever are placebos. Uh-huh. Over time, again and again and again and again. Uh-huh. The placebo effect proves itself. And the most effective drug trials are not the drug, they're the placebo, the people, and it's what you believe. Yep. Uh, it's all it all happens between those ears. Yeah. Yeah. That's why, like, I, you know, you have people all the time that'll try medication after medication after medication. And they're like, none of these are working for me. And it's, it's like, well, are, are they not working for you? Or are you going into this believing that you're not going to find anything that works for you? In which yeah. case, what do you think would work for you? Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, what other kind of evidence? Yeah. There's an interesting paradigm about the choices we make and the things we do and don't want to believe. And there's actually some level of, uh, there are some people who get more out of staying sick. Yes, absolutely. It sounds oh crazy, yes. but it's funny because I do this when I'm coaching leaders, when I do business stuff and I tell them, tell me a problem that you've had for more than three weeks, because most problems a human being can solve, mm -hmm. right? And if we have had a problem that's really bothering us for more than three weeks, we're getting something out of it. And so as I coach, I'll say like, let's say somebody has this problem with a relationship they're in. You've got that one friend who complains about that relationship for months and months and months. So let's talk about that relationship. Um, what is being in the bad relationship costing them? Like, well, they're never happy. So it's costing them their happiness. It's costing them extra money because they've got to buy this and pay their person's bills. And, and you look at that side of what it's causing. And it's almost always vitality, energy, health, money, friendship, relationships, all on that side. And I'm like, now let's look at the other side. And here are the things that most humans actually consider choosing over happiness and money and love and joy. They don't want to be controlled. Look at how many people simply won't change their diet mm -hmm. because they're avoiding being controlled, right? Or they want to be right. I can't admit that I was wrong about choosing him, mm -hmm. right? So I don't want to be controlled. I want to be right about something. Um, I don't like somebody thinking they're the boss of me. I don't like somebody else winning. These are the things that are on the other side. And on a daily basis, if we ask people, what are the choices you're making in life? Are they 
love, health, vitality, and money, or are they control, domination, safety, being right? Agreed. And it's amazing how often it's a human condition that we choose the right side. And that's true with some of the things where we can't believe that we can be healed. Mm -hmm. There's something where there's a victimization. There's somebody's hurt me and caused me to be sick. There's, I can't do this. And it's hard to look at. It takes a level of personal responsibility to go look at that and a real true desire for those things on the other side, mm -hmm. like the reconnection over the 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 need to avoid blame yeah it's the ego mm -hmm. and then that well you said it earlier the ego keeps us safe it helps us avoid risk mm -hmm. the risk of looking bad the risk of competing you know that kind of thing yeah the ego will keep us sick mm -hmm. uh are you familiar with the chakra system oh yeah a little bit. I mean, I, I do Reiki sessions. I'm not, I haven't studied it, but I know enough about it to go to people who have. <laughs> cool. I'm one of those people. If anybody's interested. Okay. <laughs> are you, are you a Reiki master? I'm not a master yet, but I am a Reiki practitioner and I've been studying the chakra system ever since I started studying yoga about, um, 20, I don't know, like, gosh, 13 years ago at this point, 14 years ago. But anyway, I bring it up because uh, I'm always curious about people who experience cancer and if they recognize any emotional, mental belief pattern stuff around the chakra associated with the area that they had cancer with. So in your point uh, would be the throat chakra. And yeah which is self-expression and truth and on it. Like, I, did you ever see any relations to that or it wasn't something you really looked at or studied or a thousand percent. And to this day, um, the focus when I go do spiritual or energy work is, is my throat chakra. And it, I've, I, so I've always been a singer I actually recorded music in Nashville in my twenties. Oh. So my, um, it's such a big part of who I am, my throat chakra. I've never had a lot of problem with feeling self-expressed and saying and engaging with people. My issue was truth. Mm. Really being willing to see a broader view that was beyond what I could understand and put in a box. Mm -hmm. And so definitely, I would say addressing that, having in order to heal, I had to, when I say let go, I had to explore truth. I had to speak truth, take some responsibility and, um, and address that in that area. I would say that was the block. Cool. I, I would too, just from hearing, but you know, it's always yes. more proof, more proof, show us more proof, you know, so we can start to bridge the gap more and more between the energy healing and the woo woo and stuff and the science and all. But anyway, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, That's beautiful. Thank you for calling that out because I hadn't really looked at it, but it's a, it's a, it's a terrific way to continue to say, yes, I had this thing. I had the universe stop me dead in my tracks and had to get my attention, but where it happened is no accident. Mm -hmm. The fact that I had an issue in my throat. And again, I was looking at it so naively. The person who told me, you've got some anger issues. I don't get angry. And somebody is saying, it's in your throat. It's a self-expression. I'm the most self-expressed. No, no, there was the, it, truth. Look for the truth. Yeah. Because I imagine you had created this image of yourself that you had projected onto everybody else. Like, this is who I am. And this is who I expect you to believe who I am. While on the inside, there was probably some subconscious that were like, actually, we don't want to be doing that. If you That's right. Stop, please. <laughs> A thousand percent. Stop keeping yourself small. I was like the humble servant, the sacrifice martyr. Yeah. And, you know, I don't regret the kindness and the the love behind it, mm -hmm. but it kept me small. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, yeah. it was harmful to you. And that's the part that we regret because we never want to do harm to ourselves while we're trying to. That's right. Us. This is another story. Again, a vision I saw 
with ayahuasca, I was in a car riding in the passenger seat and my ego was driving. And in the trunk, bound and gagged, was my higher self, inner child. And I just really experienced how often my inner child would say, this is not right. I don't feel good about this. And I would be, shh, sit down, be quiet, mm -hmm. you know? And so, yeah, that that's all self-expression. That's all, tr that's, that's my truest self had been bound and gagged, basically, and thrown in the trunk. Yeah. And that's a beautiful vision that, that we can all relate to because in a sense, every single one of us are in that same exact car with the ego being the conditioning the, and programming that we've experienced in life and how we're quote unquote supposed to be and who we're quote unquote supposed to be. While yes, it is both our highest self is our inner child. It's who we were born. You know, as someone, as a mother yourself, you probably, I assume, I'm making assumptions. I shouldn't do that. But I noticed that the personality that the child is born with is the same personality that they keep. You know, you can, the moment that they enter this world, they're either mild mannered, cheerful, or kind of catatonic and strung out Potato. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh whoever we were as a child is who our high self is which you know ch children are they're innocent and they're hopeful and they're creative and all of these things that life suppresses life tells us no you need to take those aspects and tie them you up you can't do that mm-hmm you're yes. making people uncomfortable. You're making, yeah, you're making too much noise. You're making a mess. And so, yeah, absolutely. And that, the other thing I had to really get is that we can't kill the ego. Hmm. The ego is actually a really big part. And the ego can sit in the passenger seat. But higher self is driving now. Mm -hmm. And me, this this observer in the mental part, we're going to poke our head in the middle and kind of give some thoughts as well. But yeah, I I would the 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 difference between that child's fullest expression at two and three, which is so precious, and their thwarted fearful expression at thirteen, you know, it's just um, it it shows you the conditioning, mm -hmm. and the fear that get and the power of the ego, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, no, we, we're not trying to kill it at all. That's a that's a big misconception in the spiritual world for sure, and it's more like uh, the shadow work aspect. It's integrating the the duality of your light and your dark aspects because we all have both, and yeah, they should be partners. Yes, and we're not perfect. We're not angels. We're just not. Maybe one day we will be, but right now in this experience, we're not. Mm -hmm. And so that ego, and there is an element that the ego does keep us safe. We're no longer, you know, being hunted by dinosaurs or whatever. So we don't need that level of protection, but we do need someone to kind of call us and remind us, hey, you're a human. <laughs> you can't fly. Gravity is a thing, you know? And so, uh, but the uh the the pure joy and power of letting that higher self out of the trunk kind of give them a hug dust them off say i'm really sorry i see i did that um and we're going to try not to do that so much anymore it's a whole new world yeah. yeah but also don't blame yourself for doing that because it's you know children are yeah. in the program yeah yeah so this has been super fun I've really enjoyed this conversation a lot. I really needed this today. Um, oh, good. You have a book coming out like three days from now, two days from yes. now? Yes. The launch is um, October 11th. The book is called 21 Days of Self-Love and Mindfulness. It's written with short lessons, daily lessons, but also reflection questions and journals so that you can really make it relevant. It's not academic. You could probably run through this book in two days. 
and learn a lot and get some really cute, sweet ideas, but make it relevant. So, and then I also have a YouTube channel called Thrive Through It. It has a playlist with videos for each of the days. And a lot of the stories that we've talked about today, you'll hear there. So, yeah. Cool. And that'll be out by the time this episode releases for sure. Beautiful. Beautiful. More than two days to edit. <laughs> yeah. Take your time. That's, I loved the conversation too. It's so nice to meet you. I'm following your podcast and uh, going to keep up and see who else you've got coming on and, and really appreciate getting to talk with you. Sure. Um, I don't really have anybody recently. We, we used to only do, we, we used to only do episodes with me and then I started having guests on and I only did episodes with guests for over a year and then I just kind of got burnt out on it because it's very hit and miss who you the people you bring on uh yeah. some aren't they don't have their heart and their mind in the right place and they're just trying to sell their stuff and like that's great but if you offer genuine value the stuff will sell itself if you're yeah putting up front, you know, all of the information, then they're going to be like, wow, if they're giving this away for free, I can't, let me grab that book and see what else I can get. But anyway, um, that all being said, if you have anybody that you know that you can send my way to be on the show, send them on. I will do that. Thank you. Sure. I will. All right. All right. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you.